voices of men sing your the sweetest, the sweetest name of all. Jesus, you're the sweetest name of all. Jesus, always hear a man when I call. Oh, Jesus, give me a peace that I call. You're the sweetest, the sweetest name of all. everyone. Welcome to a, a beautiful Sabbath day as we begin our Bible study and Sabbath school. Let's bow our heads for prayer as we begin our lesson. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for a beautiful Sabbath day. We thank you for the showers of blessings. May the Son of Righteousness come with rising may the sun of righteousness rise with healing in his wings to shine upon our hearts today to understand the powerful lesson on the everlasting covenant that you have made with abraham so bless us today and help us to understand what a privilege to be part of this covenant so that we will not only know your name, your covenant, and your purpose for us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today we only have five of us. While two or three are gathered in my name, the Lord says, my presence will be there. Everlasting covenant. Victor. Could you read for us Genesis 17, verse 7? Okay. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after, your, after you threw out their generations for the everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. Okay. Today we are introduced to this special term called the everlasting covenant. We know that the Abrahamic covenant is no longer there, or, or rather it has changed, but the covenant still stands today. So why is it ever, everlasting? It's a very interesting lesson today. It, is, it has not actually been abolished, or it has become obsolete. No, it has not. Today we will find out why. The summary of this lesson is, God called Abraham into a special relationship with him. One that would reveal the plan of salvation to the world. So today, we're going to recap what is a covenant. Eh? A covenant is a contract between two parties. The everlasting covenant is a covenant between God and humanity. And God uses, uh, also ratify this covenant with specific people like Noah, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The covenant or contract must contain the names of those signing it. Therefore, it is important to know the name of the parties involved. It is also important to know the terms of the contract and the obligations of each party. So we will find out God's name. He is called the Yahweh or the Eternal One. He's also called El Shaddai, Lord God Almighty. Okay, we will study uh, Abraham's name from Abraham to Abraham. 
And then uh, we will also study the Abrahamic covenant, its stages and its obligation. Okay, Lawrence, are you there to read for us? Okay. Uh, and God said to Moses, yeah. I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am, has sent me to you. Exodus 3 14. Yeah. Actually, the name of God, the Heavenly Father, is actually uh, written as in Hebrew. Uh, H, uh, Y, H, W, H. Is, you <laughs> cannot pronounce because there's no vowel. So what do they do? They add vowels so that it can be pronounced. So the name of God uh, is actually called Yahweh. Okay. Or Jehovah in English. Okay. The origin is unknown. It actually means uh, the eternal one. Okay. The Apostle John translated as who is, who was, and who is to come. The eternal one. So the name of God uh, represents his self-existence, his eternity and his sovereignty over history. So God's name itself is a mystery. We can never know Moses used this name when telling his first conversation within God and Abraham. We are encouraged to know God's name and its meaning so we can fully trust him. So although we understand that God's name is a mystery and is enshrouded with uh, unknown, we should also understand and appreciate God's name. And what is the implication? Uh, let's read this. Uh. Uh, Catherine, can you read this for us? Uh, Psalm 9, verse 9 to 10. The Lord is a shelter for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. <clears throat> those who know your name trust in you. For you, O oh Lord, do not abandon those who search for you. Okay. So this is a promise, uh, a very powerful promise when you are in trouble. A lot of times uh, we just pray to God without knowing his name. You know, the name of God is so powerful, even though we just know God's name as Yahweh. But we have to know the meaning behind. So those who know your name uh, is actually knowing God's name uh, beyond its superficial name. You must understand the significant, the significance behind God's name. So if you know, then you will have a deeper relationship. When you call upon God, it has a powerful uh, implication to our relationship. You're going to find out how as we uh, delve deeply into this lesson. Okay, Sister Helen, could you read this for us? Psalm 91, 14 to 16. Because he has set his love on me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He will call on me and I will answer him. I'll be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. I will satisfy him with long life and show him my salvation. Okay, thank you. So, in order to know God's name, you have to set your love on him. Okay, that's the first one. Huh? And then as a result, he will deliver us. Okay, he will set him on high. I will set him on high. That means what? You put him as number one. Because you have known God's name, when you call upon him, he will answer. Okay, when you are in trouble, he will deliver you. He says, I will satisfy him with long life and show him my salvation. So can you imagine the 
the peace that surpass all understanding will come upon our lives if we know God's name. So before we understand the covenant, we must understand the covenant writer, who he is and what is his name and what kind of power he can have in our lives. Uh, Rosie, can you read this for us, Rosie? I am means an eternal presence. The past, present, and future are alike with God. He sees the most remote events of past history and a far distant future with as clear a vision as we do those things which are transpiring daily. We know not what is before us, and if we did, it would not contribute to our eternal welfare. God gave us an opportunity to exercise faith and trust in the great I am. Okay, thank you, Rosie. You look at this quotation. When God say, I am, actually it is a powerful replacement of who God is. I am represents what? Represents God's eternal presence, the past, present and future. So God knows the future. He also knows the, uh, the past. But we are not to find out everything about our future. Because doesn't, God doesn't want us to know. Okay, so that we can trust Him. Now, when you know that our future is in God's hand, we will depend on Him, not depend on our human eyesight to avoid trouble because God's future includes a lot of trouble that will be for us. A lot of tests, a lot of trials, persecution and tribulation. All right, next one. Huh? Okay, next one, can we ask uh, Claire to read for us? Sorry. Uh, cannot see. So. Cannot see, yeah. Uh, how come I? Uh? Okay, we ask Annie. Annie, you can see, you know? Annie, can you read for us? Yeah, okay. Morning, everyone. Um, El Shaddai, God Almighty. Uh, that is Genesis 17, 1. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. Thank you. Okay, thanks. When he say, I am God Almighty, he is actually saying, I am El Shaddai. Okay. So, this name uh, is very, very powerful. God has many names. Uh, and this is a description of his name. I am the almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless. Talking about a relationship. So, in chapter 17, uh, God ratified his covenant with Abraham. He introduced himself as God almighty. So, Abraham could not have a child because of that weakness and frailty of the fallen human nature. Nevertheless, the Almighty One had enough power to make it possible. So at that situation, God has different meaning in our lives. Isaac blessed Jacob in the name of El Shaddai as well in Genesis chapter 28, verse 3. And God appeared before Jacob using this name in uh, Genesis 35, verse 11. Jacob also used the same name to bless others, as you can see on these references. So God is almighty, and he also has endless riches. He is willing to give from these riches to everyone who seek them with faith and obedience. Now, unfortunately, most of us are focusing on temporal blessing. Okay, we are not seeking to know God. We are not seeking to know Him in an intimate way. So that is actually very unfortunate. Okay. 
God wants us to walk before him and be blameless. Before God can be almighty in our lives. So you wonder why uh, you find that God is very far from you. Because you are not seeking to walk with him. Because you are not keeping his commandments and uh, appear to be blameless. So our priority in life is not to gain temporal blessing, but to walk before him. Okay, let's look, at, let's discuss. Uh, you know, God is almighty. He is the self-existing one. He is eternal. So when you think and hear the name Yahweh, what traits or characteristics automatically come to your mind? Okay, second question. What thoughts automatically come to mind when you think of the name Jesus? Let's open for discussion. Shall we? Pastor Chan, I think Yahweh, when uh, it was first mentioned, sort of encompassed all the rest of the characteristics uh, subsequently. It's a main uh, title, and all the rest are sub, 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 sub title. Okay. What do you think? Okay, what you say is true. So you think that God is, the name Yahweh is actually the the main name. Okay, that's what came to your mind. What about Rosie? Yeah, I just want to uh, talk about what you mentioned earlier, the I am. Um, you know, in the English language, a sentence is made up of subject and verb. That's all you need to make it a sentence. And this is a very succinct sentence. I, which is the subject, am the verb. And it's complete. It's all completion and it's so powerful because it is so short. I am. It, it does make a really big statement, the I am. And that impresses me, you know, I mean, that, 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 that God is complete. God is almighty. That, that is the power of the word I am. A very succinct sentence, but all completion in itself. What about Jesus when you think of the name Jesus? Ah, uh, Rosie. You talk, you're talking in terms of the, the language? Just the name, not language. Huh? When, you are contrasting, right? You're contrasting Yahweh and Jesus, right? Mm, okay. If I if I think of the word Jesus, I I automatically think of um Humanity. Oh, okay. I automatically think of, of him being one of us. Ah. I, mean, I think of that interpersonal, more closer relationship in a way. Ha, God is almighty, but with Jesus, because he has come down on earth, there is that closer interaction. Rightfully or wrongfully, but you know, because of the Bible talks about Jesus walked with us. So there is a closer feel. That's how okay. I, I, I relate. really another name for Jesus is called Emmanuel, right? He is called God with us. So without Jesus, uh, uh, Yahweh is actually very far away from us. And he is a God to be feared. Because as you read the story of the Old Testament, there are many instances of God's wrath uh, coming upon those who are disobedient. Whereas when you look at Jesus, when you hear his name, he ate with the tax collectors, the sinners and the prostitutes. Okay? And you can see his uh, forgiving nature. Although Yahweh in the Old Testament also exhibited forgiveness, no less. But the impression that we got from Yahweh that he is very far away. Whereas Jesus was God incarnate. Okay, he, he dwelt among us. 
So that's why uh, a lot of times when we have children, Sabbath school, we always tell them uh, to pray, to pray straight away to Jesus, eh? like, dear Jesus, more intimate. But the correct way is to pray to God, the Heavenly Father. Okay. Uh, don't pray directly to Jesus first, because that is not biblical. But when Jesus, the name came to mind, is a person who is very intimate. Okay, Rosie has mentioned that. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Anyone else? Uh, when we pray to Jesus, we affirm what we ask in God. So we say in the name of Jesus. Yeah, but, but, but when we pray, we don't address Jesus, right? Jesus is actually yeah. the... We pray to the Father, and then yeah. what we ask, we affirm. Correct. Through the Son, Jesus. He is the mediator, in other words. Okay, without mentioning the name of Jesus, our prayers will not be answered. So Jesus said, uh, you pray in my name, I will do it. Okay, that is a promise in the New Testament. Okay. Let's go to the next one. Then. Next question. Then. Among so many gods, what stands out for the God we believe? After knowing God is almighty, how does that affect your relationship? With it? okay, it's a very interesting question that we should discuss. There are so many gods that uh, other people believe, right? You got, you got the Tua Pei Kong, you got the Guan Yin, you got the Hindu gods. Among so many gods, that what stands out for the God we believe? After knowing that God is almighty, how does that affect your relationship? With him? Now, the, the context of almighty was first mentioned when Abraham was 99 years old. Okay, God is going to bless him with many children. You know that 99, he still, don't have, he still didn't have children. Okay. And God Almighty to Abraham is very, very powerful. Nothing is impossible. What about to you? How does it affect your relationship? Okay, while well, you're... Yeah, Lawrence? I think the main idea is this God has spoken. Whereas all the other gods, we try to interpret what they think and say. This God is direct. Tell you what his name is and what he can do for you. Yeah. So we have to believe him rather than all the other gods. Because all the other gods are man-made. And they are silent. Yeah, but your question, your answer... Is only answering the first question. How does that affect your relationship? You know, a lot of people, when they worship gods, other gods, they only come to him for protection, for blessing, for safety. You know, God is a God. Those gods are gods to be a peace. As you can see in the story of Jonah, right? when the boat is about to sink during the storm, everyone in their, in the, in the on board was praying to their gods. Except Jonah. Jonah was sleeping because he's trying to run away from God. And then he was questioned by the, the sailors. Why aren't you praying? You better pray to your God. So they all knew Jonah's God was actually almighty. Whereas the other sailors, they only pray to their own God because they do not know, uh, they do not have a personal relationship with Jonah's God. Then when, when the sailors realized that Jonah was actually running away from God, they were all stunned because they all know that Jonah's God was God Almighty. You don't mess with it. Whereas other gods, you can just pray to them, they will be satisfied. But apparently, 
the sailors realize that they are not offending other gods. Jonah was the one responsible to incur his own God's wrath. So suddenly they stopped praying to other gods. This is a very powerful lesson we can learn. God Almighty is the true God. Other gods are actually man-made. Other gods are gods to be feared and to be appeased, but not this almighty God. Right? Okay, Debbie, can you read this for us? Our Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. There's nothing too hard for you, Jeremiah 32, 17. Yeah, nothing is too hard for you. So when you understand God is almighty, when you are in difficult situation, God can deliver you. When the situation seems impossible, you realize that God is a God of the impossibility. So this is the implication. Okay, Victor, can you read this for us? When Abraham, uh, Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I'm God the Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will confirm my covenant between me and you and we will greatly increase your numbers. Abraham fell face down and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abraham. Your name will be called Abraham, for I am, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you and kings to come from you. Okay, this is the second time when he mentioned about the covenant. The first time was in chapter twelve. This is in chapter, then chapter fifteen, then chapter seventeen. Okay. Okay, the name of God represents his character. In a similar way, the names of people in the old Eastern world represents their character. Okay, you understand uh, how your name was given. Everyone, although we have a Chinese name, we also have a Christian name. Uh, for us Chinese, uh, the Chinese name was given to our, from our parents. But the Christian name, we choose ourselves. Right? I'm talking about those people who are first-generation Christians. When uh, something significant happened in the life of someone, they could change their name. For example, Jacob uh, was also called the deceiver. So when he wrestled with God, God decided to change his name to Israel. Uh, it represents prince. So something significant happened to him. And then Joseph's name uh, was given another name. It's an Egyptian name. It is called the Revealer of Secrets. And in the book of Ruth, Naomi's name uh, after he went through a uh, devastating loss of her husband and two sons, instead of calling her Naomi, they say, call me Mara, which is bitter. And for Daniel, uh, God is salvation. Uh, King Nebuchadnezzar called him Balthasar. That means his God protect his life. Bel. So God changed the name of Abraham to Abraham in order to highlight the fulfillment of the covenant promises. So Abraham means father is exalted. Abraham means father of a multitude. This strengthened the faith of Abraham. Okay, what about you? Do you know the meaning of your name? 
I'm talking about your Chinese name. Then later on, why do you choose your own name? For example, my name in Chinese is called Chen Si Wei. My, my family name is Chen Chan. Then my Chinese name is Si Wei. Si Wei, it has a meaning of uh, contemplation or philosophy in life or mindset. So that's the name. In fact, no, my name uh, has a meaning. Okay. Some people say, uh, in, when I went to China to do business, someone mentioned that in order for me to succeed in business, I must change my mindset. So they say, 你要改变你的思维. You know what I say to them? I say, uh, 我不用改变. I don't have to change. Because my name is already Si Wei. Okay? My name is already uh, contemplation. No need to change. Then later on, when I did church planting in 2002, we decided to name our church uh, the Ark rather than name the church under the... Because most of the time in the past, people named their church according to the street name. Like our church name uh, is called Ballastia Road. Right, because it's in Ballastia. Uh, Thompson Road is it's at Thompson Road, you see. And then when I realized that there's another church called Capo Road, so there's one church called Capo Road Baptist Church. You know, very strange name with naming after the street. But now, uh, with enlightenment, people name the church with a mission, right. New churches who are raised, they never name after the street anymore. Okay, similarly, when you name your children or when you give yourself a Christian name, there must be a meaning. For me, why do I add my name Mark? Before that, I don't have that. Because I am man in the ark. Okay, I am uh, the shepherd of this church plant called the Ark. That's why my name is Mark, Man in the Ark. So that's how the, the name came about. Okay, what about your, yourself? Do you know the significance of your name? Anyone want to share? Uh, Victor? Why, why do you call yourself Victor? <laughs> For my Chinese name, I... I, I... I can't remember. My, that's given by my father. Victor, I give him it by, by myself. I think people call me a Chinese name, uh, nickname. Uh. Why they call me Chin Te Chin Te? So I'm going to translate a bit. Uh, Victor sounds like, you know. Ah, oh, okay. Sounds like, okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's, that just came out by itself. Uh. So your name, Victor, is similar to the Chinese name. Yeah. Uh, I know of one China lady. Her name is Li Li. Li Li. Uh. Then when she, be, she came to Singapore, she just have a Christian name called Li Li. You know, it's so convenient. What about the rest? Uh, Rosie, who gave you this name? Okay, um, actually, my Chinese name is Yu Lian. All okay. the girls in the family have the middle name Yu. Ah. Jade, which means precious. Correct. So to my father, his daughters are precious. So, so we all have Yu. And then Lian is the Lian Hua, the Lian. So perhaps my parents are hoping that I'll turn out to be a beauty. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. So it's Yi Lian Jade Lotus. So okay. actually the word Rosie, the name Rosie was given by my elder sister. I didn't choose the name for myself. So perhaps she just linked associate, you know, flower to a flower. So Rose. So I'm named Rosie. Uh, Unfortunately, I didn't live up to all their dreams of being a beauty. <laughs> but this is uh, the preciousness is still there in the eyes of my father and my precious and my heavenly father as well. So the word rosy has association with the flower rose. Right? That's right. That's right. Okay. That, that's all the association. 
actually my wife's uh, middle name, uh, which is not registered, it's also called Rose. So the ah. her parents call her Rose. In fact, everybody known her as Rose. Only when she came to Singapore, she doesn't want to be called Rose Chan because Rose Chan was a uh, street. <laughs> that's an association. Yeah, so th that's not good, you know. So she preferred to be called Rosie. Ah uh, no, so uh, Debbie. Debbie. <laughs> uh, okay. okay, interesting. Uh, uh, how uh, your name came about. So, but a lot of times, uh, when people who are non Christians and uh, they choose a name. Uh, just to sound trendy. There's no meaning. Mm -hmm. So for us, uh, we are enlightened Christians. If we were to give ourselves a name when we are converted or when we have children, we better give them a name which has meaning. Like our, our first daughter, Janelle, this means uh, the root word is Jane, which is God's, uh, is God's gift, is precious, right? Something like that. So Janine is the variation of Jane as well. So it has this meaning. Okay. Catherine, can you read this for us? Now the Lord has said to Abraham, Get out of your country, from your family and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. Genesis 12, 1. Okay, God sealed his covenant with Abraham in three stages, with three parts each. Okay, number one, the approach is God said to Abraham, get out of your country, very direct command, and I will bless you. Okay, then the second, the second stage, Actually, there's only one commandment, but the, there's only one covenant. The stage, the different stages of uh, the covenant. The second stage, uh, it tells in Genesis 15 that I am the Lord. It means I, I'm the controller of your life. I'm the master. Uh, bring me a heifer. A heifer is a young goat okay, or young cattle. Is supposed to slaughter it, okay? And the promise is, I will give your descendants, to your descendants, I will give you this land. So there is a promise of a land, and then there is a promise to not only you, to your descendants. Then the third stage, huh? I am God Almighty. Okay, God said to Abraham, I am the Lord, and I am God Almighty. And every male shall be circumcised. So in other words, there will be a sign for this covenant for you to remember. I will give you the land in which you are a stranger. So this is a repetition of land, land, land. It's all about land. Okay. At first is to get out of your country, uh, make sacrifice, and then to circumcise. Okay, Lawrence, you have a question. Uh, no, I'm uh, leaving to join the Sabbath school in church because I'm in church now. Oh, it's okay. It's okay. Okay, thank you, Pastor. God established this covenant with Abraham and his descendants directly, but he also covered all humanity. So that's why it is an everlasting covenant. Now let's look at this uh, covenant that was ratified in Genesis 22. Okay. Uh, Sister Helen, could you read this for us? Are you there, Sister Helen? Or oh, she has already gone? I think she left. Okay, Rosie, can you read this for us? Sure. Genesis 22, verses 15 to 18. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son will surely 
No, your only and your son, your only son. I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Okay, this covenant is a conditional as well as unconditional covenant as we study in the lesson. The conditional is upon our obedience. Unconditional means that God is going to bless. Uh, if it's not you, somebody else. Okay. So Abraham passed the test of this covenant. And this test is not easy. Why is it not easy? Because he's supposed to sacrifice his son. Remember earlier on, he was supposed to have a son. Abraham was disobedient. He used his own method according to the suggestion of Sarah to have a son under uh, Hagar, which is Sarah's maid, rather than coming from Sarah. So they, were, they had not enough faith. Then finally they repented. God did not speak to Abraham for 13 years because of this disobedience. So 13 years later, finally, Sarah was pregnant and gave birth to Isaac. So when Isaac was a teenager, a young man, strong, able to run away, God said, this is your son, go and sacrifice. Of course, he did it in obedience without telling his wife. When he is about to sacrifice the son, God said, wait, I have seen your faith. So Abraham became the father of the Jews, of the Israelites. That's why he was given a title, Father Abraham. Great respect for this great man because of his faith. You know, God was so happy with Abraham that he said, I will surely bless you. This is a powerful assurance. The descendants will be as many as the stars and the seashore. You will take possessions of the city and through your offspring, all nations will be blessed because of you. Now, it is very important that when we we need to realize that when we obey, our descendants will be blessed because of us. If we disobey, our descendants will be cursed or suffered persecution because of us also. Remember the second covenant. Uh, if you worship idols, there will be the gods are rough on the second and third or fourth generation. So similarly, Whatever we do, the decisions that we make will affect our descendants. So if we are blameless, we are obedient, we are showing a good example to our descendants, to our children and our sphere of influence. Okay, Julius? Or see, I'll read. Yeah, can you read? For I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. Yeah. He says here, God reiterate the importance of keeping his command, okay, to do righteousness and justice so that the covenant can be fulfilled. This is the covenant of grace. It was God's initiative and he offers to do for us what we can. However, it's not a unilateral covenant. Those who accept God's covenant have to do their part. The covenant is broken when we disobey God. So 
please remember, God does not save us because we obey Him. He saves us by grace alone. Then our obedience to His law reflects our response of faith and love. So God uses our obedience to fulfill the promises of His covenant in us. So God's covenant is given to us for us to reciprocate, is to obey. Okay, then comes the question. Uh, before that, uh, that, let's look at, let's read this. Uh. Uh, Annie, can you read this for us? Genesis 17 verse 11. Uh, Any, are you there? Any? Okay. We ask uh, Sister Helen, can you read for us? Genesis 17 11. Okay. I, yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, uh, I tried to uh, unmute. Okay, and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. Genesis 17, 11. Okay. Now, when God said, in order for us to remember this covenant, you have to circumcise. Now, circumcision was introduced during that time. It is a very strange sign because it is also a very personal sign. A sign of a man have to circumcise. It is not only painful, it can be very embarrassing when you are doing it as an adult. So the question is, what was the purpose of circumcision as a sign? Okay, the answer is found here. Uh, we have just read it to perpetuate the memory of the covenant. Okay, that's the first purpose. What is the second purpose? Can somebody read, uh, Debbie? And you shall be... Hey, no, no, no. Which read, one? Read below. Just read below. Which, which one? Um, the purpose, is it? Yes, to symbolize. To symbolize circumcision of the heart. Um, below, please. A man is not a Jew if he is only one outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a man is a Jew if he is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the spirit, not by the written code. Such a man's praise is not from man, but from God. So in other words, huh? A person has to circumcise during that time. It is an object lesson of obedience. Okay? Circumcision of the heart. That means you cannot be like the rest. Okay? What is the third purpose? Third purpose we ask, uh, Kat, uh, uh, Helen, Sister Helen? Third purpose. To foreshadow. Huh? Uh, to foreshadow the Christian rite of baptism. Yeah. Can you read this? And you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. Okay. You didn't see this? Uh? Wait, uh, hold on. Uh, Colossians, Colossians. Oh, oh, oh. In him, you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. By putting off the body of the sins of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him, through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. So in other words, uh, today we don't circumcise uh, physically. We replace circumcision with baptism. In the Old Testament, uh, if you are not circumcised, uh, you will be 
consider a Gentile or outcast, you will lose your salvation if you are living in the Old Testament time. Similarly, today we practice uh, spiritual circumcision of our hearts. And this is replaced by baptism. That means we have to die to our whole self and raise with him. That's why Christians who are not baptized, they are not spirit, spiritually circumcised. So this is a very important lesson. Okay? So if you are not baptized, you cannot be saved. Just like what Jesus said, unless you are born of the water and of the spirit, you shall never enter the kingdom of God. Next, what is the next purpose? To foster moral purity. Okay, uh, this one we ask Annie. Uh, no, Annie already read, sorry. Uh, Catherine? Read this uh, Deuteronomy chapter Yeah, 10. I know, cannot see. Okay, can. Uh, Deuteronomy 10, 16 to 18. So, circumcise your hearts, therefore, and do not be stiff neck any longer. For the Lord God is your God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality and accepts no bribes. So, circumcision is actually to tell you you shall know. You should not be stiff neck, huh? show no partiality and accept no price. That means you must be honest in your ways, have integrity. Okay? This is a very important uh, point. The last point uh, we ask Debbie to read. You want me to read, to distinguish, is it? Yeah. To distinguish the seed of Abraham from the Gentiles. Ephesians 2, 11 to 13. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision that done in the body by the hands of man. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were, were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. Yeah. Do you know that circumcision involves uh, blood when you cut the foreskin? So right now... Uh, the Lord Jesus has spared us from physical circumcision through the death of his son, Jesus. And because we believe in Jesus, we must uphold spiritual purity, moral purity, so that we can distinguish from the world. We can never live like the world anymore because they have no hope, no promise, and no God. For us, we have God, we have the Pope, we have the promise. The next question is, why is circumcision no longer a sign of the covenant? So after some time, this sign was misinterpreted as a means of salvation. So it's lost its original meaning. In Jesus, circumcision was replaced by faith that works through love a new creation and keeping of the commandments. Okay, we ask Julius or Cynthia to read for us. Was a man already circumcised when he was called? He should not become uncircumcised. Was a man uncircumcised when he was called? He should not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. Keep God's commands. Commands is what counts. So in other words, uh, it is very important for us not to focus on external works to show our spirituality. But important, our priority is to keep God's commandments. So the commandments of God uh, is still stand. 
So a lot of people say we are not under law, we are under grace, which is not right. Okay, We are no longer under the external law that points to Christ, but we are keeping the eternal law of Jesus, which is the Ten Commandments. Don't get confused. So, in other words, a person who is circumcised, don't go and uh, search for the foreskin uh, and sew it back. That's what it means. So, if you are uncircumcised, don't go and uh, purposely look for circumcision. Okay? Whether you are circumcised or uncircumcised, is nothing. Focus on keeping God's commandments. That is the priority. Okay, Victor, can you read this for us? When the principle of love is implanted in the heart, when man is renewed after the image of him that created him, the new covenant promise is fulfilled. I will put my laws in the hearts and the minds when I write them. And if the law is written in the heart, will it not shape our life? Obedience, the service and the allegiance Allegiance of love is a true sign of discipleship. Yeah. So in other words, so in other words uh, we should not focus on the external keeping of the law. We should focus on the inward cultivation of our relationship with Jesus so that out of our outpouring of love for Jesus, it is shown in our obedience, serving God and loving him through the keeping of the command. That's why Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So today, that's the end of our lesson. God called Abraham into a special relationship with him. The one would reveal the plan of salvation. To him. And this is the plan of salvation. Let me repeat, God is going to bless us. And God is going to have a covenant with us. For us to fulfill the covenant today, we have to circumcise our heart through the obedience of his calling by keeping the Ten Commandments. And it's by doing that, we can find the path to salvation. Any question? That is why it's called the eternal or the everlasting covenant. Anything to add? If there is none, Let's end with prayer. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Abrahamic covenant promise to bless us when we obey, when we remain faithful, when we live a righteous life and remain blameless. I pray that as we believe in Jesus, we become the children of Abraham and as according to the promise. So bless us with the Abrahamic covenant that is found in Jesus. Be with us as we walk with you, as we circumcise our hearts daily in the renewal of this covenant. We hope that one day we, have, we, will, have, we will inherit the heavenly land that you have promised us. So meanwhile, Help us to increase our faith as we love you day by day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, everyone. Have a wonderful Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Chan. Welcome.